Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, today on the podcast, we're going to be doing a topic that I'm going to confess was my choice. I have always been interested in volcanoes. I think, you know, if I had another eight lifetimes to live, perhaps at some point I'd become a volcanologist. I, I, I just find them really fascinating. Some of you may have noticed I wasn't here for a couple of weeks. I actually took a trip to visit some volcanoes. And so today I said, can we talk about the archetype of the volcano? Volcanoes are really interesting scientifically. I won't pretend to have much knowledge. I will try to talk about what I do know today, and I'm sure I will butcher it all. So all of those geologists and volcanologists that are listening, feel free to write in and correct me. But of course, they're also very interesting mythologically. There's, there's a ton of great mythological stuff from various sources about volcanoes. And they're also just a wonderful, I suppose, symbol for psychological processes. And this enters our language. We talk about, we talk about things feeling volcanic or, or emotions erupting. So we're going to be just having fun with all of this today. And I'm, I'm personally really excited for this one. So Joseph, thank you for, uh, going along with this with me. And we should just mention also that uh, Deb took some time off to have an adventure of her own this week. So it will just be me and Joseph. So I thought that um, I would just jump in and read a quote of Jung's from The Symbolic Life. And he's talking about our relationship to nature. Man feels himself isolated in the cosmos He is no longer involved in nature and has lost his emotional participation in natural events, which hitherto had a symbolic meaning for him. Thunder is no longer the voice of a god, nor is lightning his avenging missile. No river contains a spirit, no tree means a man's life, no snake is the embodiment of wisdom, and no mountain still harbors a great demon. His immediate communication with nature is gone forever, and the emotional energy it generates has sunk into the unconscious. And so Jung is talking about the rise of the scientific attitude, particularly intensely in his time period. And one of the things that Jung tries to do, and we try to do here at this Jungian life, is to restore that strata of the mythic, of the psychic, to the natural phenomena, which in a sense ensouls the things that our eyes report to us. And so as we move around the mythology of volcanoes and use it as a metaphor, we are trying to return the spirit to the physical. And so one thing I'm curious about, Lisa, just in terms of your personal experience, how did your psyche respond when you were close to an active volcano? What did it do to you? That's that's a that's a great question. Well, I I did get um, to climb up uh, Stromboli, which is a volcanic island off the north coast of Sicily, that has been continuously erupting for three thousand years, and so I I did get to see it give a little bit of show after sunset. I want to say that there's a kind of inflation that goes along with it. It's so tremendously exciting, and you feel like you're close to. Well, you feel like you're close to what Jung called the central fire. So it's tremendously exciting. It was perhaps a little bit more humbling being uh, on the summit of Etna. So I also did climb up Etna, which is on the mainland of of Sicily. And we'll be talking more about Etna today because there's lots of great stories connected with it. But it was so barren and uh, overwhelming and kind of inhospitable at one point you know it's very cold even though it was you know quite hot in Sicily in September 
cold and the wind is whipping around and you have to have on, you know, all kinds of special gear. And and the, the guy took out a piece of paper and simply put it in a small crack in the ground and it lit on fire. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> small but really intense and really close by <laughs> so it it um it was a little more humbling and a, and a little kind of tiring in a way and i i found that i was happy to get back to normal sized everyday reality there at the bottom of the mountain i i am struck by that image of just slipping a little piece of paper through a crack in the earth and having it burst into flames that mm-hmm. that is so intense yeah and it you know really holds that paradox of something being small and human that you can hold in your hand and then also something right under your feet just a few inches under your feet which is a life threatening and mm-hmm. overwhelmingly powerful and only this little thin, cool crust is protecting you from it. (laughs) Yes. Which in a way is kind of Jung's model of the psyche. Exactly. That we are standing, the ego is standing on this thin crust and right underneath us is this roiling ocean of power. That's right. And, uh, And sometimes a little fissure opens up and and even though it's just a little crack, the energy that comes out of that's enough to change your life. You know, I think that any large natural phenomenon often functions as a symbol of the self. So whether or not we're talking about a hurricane or a tornado or the ocean, I, I think volcano kind of fits in that category. It is awe-inspiring, and in that sense, it is numinous. There are features of volcanoes that make them particularly good symbols for the relationship between the unconscious and the conscious. And it's just as you were saying, Joseph, and I have a little quote here from Jung. He says, we are constantly living on the edge of a volcano. And there is, as far as we know, no way of protecting ourselves from a possible outburst that will destroy everyone within reach. So it sounds like he's talking about uh, World War II on one level, this roiling psychic infection that um, is right under the surface of what looked like a fairly intellectual and civilized society. Yep. But right underneath it, you know, fire is bursting out. I, th- I think it's great to link it to, to World War II. And, and even in the times we're, we're living now, that there is a kind of caldera that we're all sitting upon. And we don't know when it's going to go. But of course, that's also an apt description for any one of us in our kind of personal day-to-day life. I mean, what kind of unprocessed grief rage, envy, kind of shadow stuff that's down there beneath the surface, bubbling, as you will, that might erupt at any minute. I mean, I can certainly relate to that. I I have a little bit of a hot temper. I, I am chagrined to admit, but there it is. It's the truth. And I can be somewhat explosive sometimes. So I, I know what it, I can relate to that volcanic experience. Well, and, and of course, everything is in different magnitudes of order. So there's, you know, really venting off the hot material of the psyche and really, you know, ranting at the heavens. And then there's that explosive, overwhelming moment. And the next thing you know, you're shouting at your boss and you're resigning and you're walking mm-hmm. out of the right. door, which right. is which is a more, a more globally powerful decision and on and on from there. But this feeling that pressure builds up and if the pressure is not released in one way or another, at some times it's going to create a radical change. And the basis of the word tectonic is tecton, which means builder, ironically. So when we think about 
the tectonic tension in the psyche, building, 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 and then there's the eruption of some unconscious material, that it also is in service to building a new life, sure. building a new attitude. And and this is maybe a good time to visit my very superficial knowledge of volcanology. Uh, and again, <laughs> I welcome input from people who know more than I do. Volcanoes tend to occur at uh, areas of convergence and divergence of uh, tectonic plates. My understanding is that you get slightly different kinds of volcanoes depending on whether these are places where the plates are diverging, like at the seafloor, and you get these underwater volcanoes that are kind of constantly creating new crust. They're underwater just all the time. Or in subduction zones where one plate is being kind of pushed underneath the other, which is the case actually in this area of Italy where I was. It's a subduction zone. In that case, I believe that it's accurate to say that part of what is happening is because of the friction of the two plates rubbing against each other, the the crust is actually being broken down, melted, turned into magma, which then, of course, gets expelled in these eruptions creating new crust, creating new land. So we are looking at this force that is primordial and is both incredibly destructive and also creative. And in fact, uh, today, when I went to Google Volcano in preparation for this, the headline that came up was, there's a new island in the Pacific as a result of volcanic activity. Now, they say it probably won't stay there, but certainly volcanic activity creates new land. Uh, it creates new rock. I mean, that's, that's another thing that's kind of fascinating about it is much rock takes eons to create sedimentary rock. Volcanic rock is kind of created in an instant, um, which is fascinating to me. Uh, so you're actually seeing a kind of geologic process that happens, in fact, very quickly when you're talking about something volcanic. And that part of the rapid creation involves rapid destruction as well. I mean, in the island in the Pacific, we might imagine that this is happening in the open waters, so the destruction is not quite so clear. But, you know, Pompeii being the great example, you know, a, a volcano can erupt and simply wipe away an entire city as mm -hmm. well, and yet cover it in a kind of fertile mineral base which once that begins to break down, becomes part of this lush regrowth and reestablishing. And, and haven't we all gone through at least one experience of that in our own psychological lives, whether it was purely internally or perhaps something that was a big external transformation which involved um, letting go or dissolving or destroying the old thing one of the things that struck me was I, I can't tell you how many people told me when I was in Sicily, you know, and I, I visited the city of Catania, which sits kind of underneath Etna. And several people said, we call Etna Mama Etna. And, and they were very emphatic about this. And, and the, the volcanologist guide is, who took us up to Etna said, we think Etna is a, is a female. And part of the reason for that is because of these explosions, the area around Etna is incredibly fertile. Mm. The produce is just, you know, especially delicious and, uh, and, and rich and fecund because of the volcanic soil. And drawing in another mythology is that Hawaii, which is, of course, a culture that for thousands of years has surrounded this volcanic activity, attributes volcanic eruptions to Pele, who is the beautiful and tempestuous goddess of volcanoes, and that she would have these moments of rage and anger, and this, the volcano would explode. And so part of the religious process was to propitiate Pele to kind of keep her <laughs> anger at bay. Yeah, that's great. I'm really glad you brought that up because she's an important volcano goddess 
And that kind of maps onto this idea about this as a feminine power, this kind of creation destruction, which we often see with uh, the goddess. And meanwhile, there are also some volcano gods, such as, for example, Vulcan, which is where we get the word from, who is the Roman counterpart of Hephaestus. We have both of these things in play here. There's a kind of rich mythological pantheon around volcanoes. So if we uh, lean into the Hephaestus story a bit, that Hephaestus was the club-footed, imperfect, very human, often embarrassed god. Cuckolded. Cuckolded in a way that was really humiliating, who is in his workshop under the ground, firing up the bellows, striking at the metal, and that the volcanic explosions were the sparks from his workshop. And his primary task, although not the only one, was to make tools for Zeus to help him control the world. And so in that myth, the fire has something to do with, quite frankly, that patriarchal determination to subdue nature and subdue individuals to comply with the prevailing culture. But it's also associated with the fire being channeled into uh, creative ends. And Hephaestus made beautiful, wonderful, kind of magical things as well. So it's another image of the kind of creative aspect of fire. And um, the god Vulcan is slightly different in the Roman pantheon. But again, with this, this real emphasis on, well, we have to propitiate this god because fire can be so destructive. But at the same time, it's so tremendously creative. And undoubtedly, undoubtedly so. And, and when I talk about it as part of that effort to exert cultural control, that is part of creativity. I mean, creating a culture is no small thing. And whether we agree with the cultural values, thinking they're positive or negative, it's all an effort to bring order from chaos. Mm -hmm. and, and that is also in the realm of the self being an ordering principle. Yeah. And I mean, as I said earlier, you're, you're kind of bringing it around to the self. I think volcanoes can, can be a particularly potent image of the self. They almost have a mind of their own. They can seem dormant for a long time. It seems like nothing's going on. And then they, they kind of kick off. They're essentially unpredictable at this point, although there are there are warning signs, and I think volcanologists are getting better kind of predicting when there might be a problem. But if you look at Mount St. Helens, it's a great example. It was just absolutely quiet for a long time. And then there were these earthquakes and these different kinds of activity that, that it was going through. And the volcanologist said, listen, something's going to happen. We need to close the area. There was tremendous pressure not to comply with that recommendation, but but they did, and it probably saved just countless lives that that area was closed at the time of that uh, enormous eruption. So it's it's the sense of something that's really beyond conscious control that seems to have its own sense of telos, that it's so much bigger than ego. And this is also where I think the experience of inflation comes up, in my interests in uh, volcanology and in part to kind of prepare myself for the trip, I, I went to see that movie that's out. It's a documentary. It's called The Fire of Love. And it's a documentary about a couple, a French couple of volcanologists who uh, spent their lives sort of traveling from volcanic hotspot to volcanic hotspot around the globe. These just incredible... Uh, they, they took a lot of um, videos. And so there are these incredible images, uh, footage of them sort of standing right at the edge of a crater with just, you know, the whole screen is taken up with molten lava. And there's just this one little person in this kind of 
protective suit. I mean, it was it was something I wanted to make sure that I saw on the big screen because of images like that. But you know, as I suspected, there there was a certain kind of inflation. You know that that we can get close to this. The self draws us closer to it. We are fascinated with it. We want to get closer to it. And some of us are kind of drawn to it in these ways um, where we could, we could get burned up in getting, in getting too close to the central fire. And in fact, that is what happened to these two volcanologists. They were, they went to the, um, I think it's Mount Unzen in Japan was exhibiting some activity and they went to observe the eruption and they did not survive. There was a massive pyroclastic flow that uh, killed a number of people, including these two volcanologists. So, so there's, there's something about the power and, and I think it's really sort of the symbol of that, which is so much bigger than ego we want to control it, perhaps. This one French volcanologist in the film, he had a, a dream of creating a boat that he could use to ride on a flow of lava. <laughs> he never did it. but, but It's quite th- a fantasy. Was, it's quite a fantasy, isn't it? So that, that we could control this or we could be in control of it. And, and this is the age-old kind of hubris. I think this idea that that we can master all things, I I mean, I understand that's part of the human spirit, particularly triumphing over matter itself. But in our imaginations, we often fantasize that we can lay right up against the gods with no repercussions, or perhaps even triumph over them. In one sense, I I even feel that in the ancient mythology, because once we start adding anthropomorphic images to natural phenomena, we are trying to take something that we really cannot control and turn it into a person who we can interact with, negotiate with, offer sacrifices to. and, And in that same way that the scientist was imagining a boat to ride across the lava in, imagining that whatever sacrifice is going to change how nature behaves. Any of these efforts that we have to try to reduce our existential anxiety in one part, and also to try to minimize the suffering that nature can cause us, either because of the uncertainty around how it will behave, or because we really do see harsh and life-threatening things that nature serves up to us, and we're trying to figure out some way to not be in a constant state of horror. You know, you mentioned sort of taking these uncontrollable and ununderstandable natural phenomenon and and kind of creating persons associated with them. Uh, there's also the story of Typhon, this terrible monster that Zeus was uh, in a battle with. And Zeus managed to overcome him and then to kind of subdue him, he stuck him, so the story goes, under Mount Etna. So I think that's another explanation for Etna's activity is that there's this monster underneath trapped by the mountain who's kind of spewing forth repressed fury as a result of having been defeated by Zeus. And so there's a way in which the cosmic order is being maintained by taking something that is dangerous and placing it under the earth where it only intermittently roars and spits magma, but for the most part is rather calm and just rumbling in the distance. And such a perfect way of understanding how we cope, that when we are in a terrible war, inside of ourselves. Sometimes, if there is no other choice, the psyche will take one side of the war and plunge it into the unconscious, but it never goes to sleep fully. Mm -hmm. So there are still eruptions, whether, just as you said, it might be an angry outburst, but the eruptions from beneath can show up as strange somatic disorders, 
the body's not behaving correctly. There are ways in which it can show up as misfortune around us that our unconscious mind can pull certain behaviors out of other people, which are disadvantageous to us, or in some cases, it can blind us from seeing something, perhaps like a, a vehicle careening towards us as we're stepping in the street, or the terrible story that Jung tells of a young man he had given a warning to who was mountain climbing, saying, you know, you, you need to give up mountain climbing. Your dreams are dangerously um, informative. And the fellow did just kind of walk off the edge of a mountain, which cost him his life. So this feeling that monsters are underneath in the unconscious. And in one way, mythologically, we have to keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on under there and not forget it in some way. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, sometimes things do need to be put into a repressed state because the ego can't develop without some of these primordial forces mm -hmm. being put to sleep or put under the ground, at least for a while. Yeah. When I think about what we know about the structure of the planet, that there is this, this friendly crust that we're very familiar with that we live upon, but deep underneath there's this kind of liquid magma that, you know, there's like a sea beneath our feet of swirling liquid rock for heaven's sake. And that is, in some sense, a little bit like how I imagine the unconscious. It seems like it's pretty far away and, and it, it's doing whatever it does down there, but mostly we don't have to know about it, except in, in these places where it, it kind of pokes through, some of them being volcanoes. So that, that's another way that I, that I think it's a pretty good metaphor or a, an evocative symbol and, you know, related to that, another belief about volcanoes in, in many cultures is that they are the entrance to the underworld or the entrance to hell. So this is the point of communication, if you will, between consciousness and the unconscious. Yeah, in Ovid's Metamorphosis, which was written in the Christian era, Pluto leaves the underworld through Mount Etna again, so that the underworld is placed within the earth's crust and that it is associated with fire and brimstone and sulfurous odors and this destructive consuming magma. And uh, Christian religion has absorbed that part of the mythology. And we begin to feel that hell is somehow in the earth and that God is somehow above the earth and far away. Mm -hmm. you know, one way we might wonder about that in terms of the larger psychic possibility is that something in humanity needed to put the God image away and far away from the human personality. Mm -hmm so that we were not overwhelmed in our own ego development. And this goes to Jung and Neumann's idea that the ego has to separate from the primordial self at birth and through the next several years and to create a tremendous amount of distance so that I become a discrete, small ego and I'm not overwhelmed with all of the archetypal conditions that the mm -hmm. primordial God image carries. It feels to me that this separation of heaven and earth and heaven and hell is part of that effort to become a discreet and specific person. And then, of course, it makes hell a lot closer than heaven, which becomes an interesting theological problem. Yes, and and it also separates the divine from those earthly, chthonic qualities that we find in this mythology of volcanoes, for example, that it can be both creative and destructive at the same time. That's, that's not so much an aspect of the Christian God. 
but it is an aspect of God in many other cultures, and especially often the, um, the goddess. You know, Kali, for example, is the creator and the destroyer. And we know that sort of nature is the creator and the destroyer. So somehow this kind of spiritualized Christian God that gets, you know, kind of lobbed out there into the heavens gets separated a little bit from that kind of earthiness that we see in a God like Phaestus. Right. I think that the Christian God is always calm, very Apollonic in a lot of ways, Mm -hmm. harmonious, musical, calm, Mm -hmm. a being of light, of undifferentiated light. And then all of the primal, natural and bestial parts of humanity are forced into the earth, not just on the earth, but down below the crust. There's, there's also this idea, at least for me, when I think about volcanoes, about the magma in some way being an image of the primordial source. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it really is, if you, if you want, it's, <laughs> I mean, magma is a great image for the prima materia. It's a liquid rock. It hasn't taken form. I, I'm thinking of a, a sort of literary example of volcanoes with uh, the Lord of the Rings, And of course, the ring has to be taken. It can only be destroyed in one place. And that is Mount Doom. It cannot be destroyed in ordinary fire, no matter how hot. It can only be destroyed in Mount Doom, which of course is essentially a volcano. And the climax of the trilogy happens right at the the brink, uh, where it has to be thrown in. This idea that we could have access to that somehow, that this is awful and terrible and and frightening and destructive, but it's also the primordial source from which all things come. You know, another Etna story here that I think is related to what I'm talking about is the myth around the death of the pre-Socratic philosopher Empedocles. He was an important pre-Socratic philosopher. He was a real person. He really lived, but there's this what is almost certainly sort of a legend about his death was that he climbed Mount Etna and threw himself into the crater, either believing he was a God or hoping that he would become a God or that he could prove that he was a God. There's all kinds of variations on it. And it's either sort of uh, triumphant that he was then kind of lofted up to the heavens from the volcano summit, or that this was a real example of a kind of hubris but it's that longing for the source, I think. I think that longing for return is really powerful. I think in modern times, people have that experience when they're at a great height. They suddenly be overcome with this fantasy of casting themselves off. This used to happen frequently enough at the top of the Empire State Building that they had to cage it in because they could just anticipate a certain percentage of people would have an overwhelming beckoning to cast oneself into the into the divine void in one way or another. And the fantasy of somehow returning to the primal, perfect wholeness in one way or another is seductive and dangerous. It goes back again to Jung's idea of the regression, that there's something inside of us that longs to go back to that primal union And when it happens prematurely, there's a tragedy. When it happens very much at the end of life, there's a sense of appropriateness that as we naturally near death, we hear the call to return to the primal sleep, the primal unity, but that we have to kind of fight against that urge while we are still vital and have work to do in the world. The um, Japanese also, at one point in their ancient history used to dispose of the dead in volcanoes mm-hmm. that it was a place where the dead could then go to the next world it was a portal as well mm-hmm. a way of going mm-hmm. through to something else when we think about the self a lot of times we tend to project a certain sweetness on it which i think is deceptive and jung worked 
tirelessly to disavow us of that idea. Mm -hmm. And I think the volcano really captures the bivalence of this image of the self, that yes, it is creative, but it's a kind of creative act that has to be observed from a distance because it is too much for we vulnerable humans. It is not of human scope. It is not, and that its destruction can be terrifying and, again, cannot be controlled by human intervention. And yet we rely on it in as much as the Earth requires these eruptions in order to continue to be physically viable. It's renewing. It is renewing. An another way to think about it in terms of just the geological phenomena is that even the Earth, has something specific in it that every so often it needs to get rid of. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the volcano is an off-casting of tension when it's put into this very um, physical term, but that something needs to be released out into the upper world for the, so to speak, health of the planet as a whole. And that the cost of that, in terms of human life, is irrelevant, as, as it is with nature. You know, there's a fairy tale that's called the Golden Tree. And it has, it's a, it's a lovely tale, but it has this image in it that I, I just want to share. There is a golden tree, and uh, when you draw closer to it, you see that it's actually not static. It's actually constantly being created out of this kind of fountain of molten gold. And then as soon as it forms, it breaks off and falls back into the, the liquid gold underneath. So the hero has to find a way to break a branch off of this tree. But it's just a fantastic image, I think, of this ongoing process of creation and destruction that's ever renewing that that we can witness in some sense in our in our lives psychologically and also when we when we see volcanoes it also reminds me of jung's attitude towards the creative spirit mm -hmm. that creativity will rise up out of the molten gold and then we have to risk something in order to break a piece of it off and bring it back. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of like stealing fire from the gods. Yes. That this transcendental branch is now going to be mine and the ramifications for that. Jung felt that the unconscious would make us pay for what we extract from it mm -hmm. in order to create and put it out into the world. And maybe that payment is a kind of suffering, a kind of neurotic process that one has to go through, but that the unconscious can be somewhat selfish about its own material. And so there is a heroic element to getting a piece of that branch for oneself. That's, that's really, that's really lovely. That's really perfect. You know, um, as with, I think, other similar phenomena, volcanoes show up a lot in dreams. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During dream school's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there.
what I did was I went back and kind of mined through our, our wonderful dream database of people that have sent us dreams. And I, I found an older dream that a listener submitted that is a volcano dream. And uh, I think I'm just going to read that right now. And maybe, Joseph, you and I can talk about the image of the volcano in the dream. Uh, So this dreamer is a 32-year-old woman, and she says, A man and a woman are hiking down through a rocky environment. The man is leading her and tells her that they are on the side of a volcano. She's intrigued and allows him to guide her. They walk around for a while, and then on their way back to the top of the volcano, they come across a large stone bridge. The bridge is wide, made of heavy stones, the color of sandstone, like something out of ancient Rome or medieval Spain. The rapids beneath the bridge are incredibly strong. The waters are white. The man and the woman embrace each other on the bridge in an all-encompassing, deeply intimate hug. The emotion is palpable. There is a close-up of her face, and she looks alarmingly like Beyonce. She fights tears. I can only see the man's back, but I can tell he too is fighting tears. When they pull away from each other, they see at their feet, right where they are standing, a bright orange ember burning close to the ground. This signals to them that they have to go. At this point, I am now the woman. The volcano is unstable, and we only have a few moments before we can make it to the other side before eruption. We pull away from each other and start heading to the top of the volcano. As we walk hand in hand, magma begins to break through the dark charcoal gray landscape like veins through skin. Then the volcano begins to erupt. Smoke billows, lava flows, and the man and I face away from the eruption, pressed up against something like the side of a wall. He presses himself against my back. I wonder if he's even really there or if he's going to stay. Everything goes black. The ash engulfs us. We survive. The sun reemerges, and I leave my male companion and climb to the top left side of the volcano, where I find a small wooden hut. I pull aside a curtain and see that inside of the hut are my older brother, sitting next to his child self, as well as my child self, though she's sitting on her own. I check on them and ask them if they're all right. A woman's hand hands me a cool washcloth, and I believe the woman is my deceased grandmother. I press it to my brother's face, then his child self, then my child self. I tell them I'll be back, as they seem somewhat infirm. My brother jests, hey, mind bringing me some coffee? His child self jumps in and says, yeah, me too, to which I respond, I'm not bringing you anything, but I'll bring her coffee as I point to my child self. She smiles and the dream ends. And for context, she says, I'm in therapy and it's brought up years of childhood neglect. I'm only just starting to process. I'm also in a push-pull casual sexual relationship with a man who is himself going through intense changes in his life. So there's the image of the volcano sort of in action, as you will. What do you, what do you make of it, Joseph? Well, if I break the dream up into three stages, you know, there's the appearance of the animus and this adventure, which culminates in a connection and a great passion. The passion then leads to this volcanic destructive explosion, which then leads to this appearance of the child selves. So I think it's an apt metaphor for a very deep psychoanalytic process that the path to connect and the path for romantic love, at least in this dream, is fraught with a kind of unconscious activation, an explosive unconscious activation, which then casts the dream ego back in time into this regression where she's dealing with early childhood dynamics and choosing there at the end to tend at least to her own inner child, which ostensibly is in fact the medicine that's required for her to be able to tolerate the kind of passions that rise up in these erotic situations. 
It's, I, have, I think I have a slightly different read on it. Let me throw it out and you let me know what you think about it. I'm more thinking that the analytic process that she's been going through has kind of thinned the earth's uh, crust and allowed this tremendous explosion and eruption to happen. And it could be that the uh, engagement with the male figure, the anonymous figure, is an image of her being able to companion herself or perhaps finding that in the analyst and then and then in herself, and that there is something potentiating about the hug on the bridge. I don't necessarily see it as um, about eroticism in the external life, but but more about this sort of inner union. And then, you know, the, this image, the most striking part for me about the dream anyway, was this image of these these red veins through the gray ash. And, you know, sometimes if, if we've been through really difficult experiences in childhood, they may be covered up with a lot of gray ash, but then here they are poking through and then they erupt explosively, seemingly in a way that could be quite destructive. And, you know, doing early trauma work and therapy can feel exactly like that. But at the end of it, what's left is the ability to go back and be with her wounded child self and tend to her, you know, in a way. And, and so, you know, I'm curious about the brother and I'd, I'd be curious about that relationship. It seems like the dream ego at the end is able to set a boundary with the dream brother and really focus on meeting her own needs. So I'm seeing it more as an image of something that might kind of erupt in a therapeutic process, but might have been early wounds that have been roiling there. To me, I see them both as parallel processes that if this is the state of a purely internal condition, it's undoubtedly influencing outer relationships. But I take your meaning that if we have a purely subjective lens, that we could uh, put it in that context and that the connection with the animus releases this huge amount of libido, which is frightening, and its ability to reconfigure you know, the inner world. But I also think that for, for many of us that were raised in really, really difficult homes as children, mm-hmm. that our ability to regulate affect is often compromised, that there's often a lot of unmetabolized, intense feeling. Now, the dreamer suggests that right now, at least, she's dealing with being neglected as a child, which suggests that as a child, when she would have the natural tempestuous eruptions that children have, there was no adult there to mediate it to Mm -hmm. actually calm her, to put it into its right perspective or to help her or demonstrate to her how to contain it. So in the dream, he's fighting back tears. They pull away from each other and where they were standing, there's this amber burning close to the ground. And that's the signal that they have to flee, that they have Mm -hmm. to get away because of the combustibility of what's Mm -hmm. happening and yes that is absolutely an internal place and it it also happens in the external relationships that we play out our childhood wounds with our closest Mm -hmm. partners unfortunately i mean we wish we could protect people from our unfinished business but uh, you know freud and jung and lots of others have clearly demonstrated that we can't Mm -hmm. but as you said the uh the most important part is the sun emerges, everyone's still alive, and that she really has a solo journey. She leaves her companion. She climbs to the top of the mountain, so to speak, which is often a metaphor for a kind of internal and a deep spiritual journey. Mm. And then in the hut where often the sage could be, mm-hmm. there's her brother and her their inner children, and what seems to be some kind of uh, a mother figure, the deceased mother. Yes, yes, the kind of wise old woman. It also, to me, leans into the idea of the archetypal compensation, that when we are lacking enough parental care as children, 
an archetypal image of the mother, for instance, will then try to tend us just to keep us psychologically alive until we can kind of get to adulthood and then kind of grapple with whatever we need to. So it seems like there's almost a spirit woman who's tending mm-hmm. to the children. Very importantly, at the end, she decides, no, I'm, I'm going to be involved in this. And she does, but she's going to bring her kid coffee, which is a bit complicated. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting, too. We'd have to talk about the archetype of coffee. Yes. <laughs> which is very um, enlivening. I, I d- <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and right? that, might, that might be relevant. Yeah, it's right. That might be relevant. You give a kid a cup of coffee, you better be ready. <laughs> for what happens <laughs> um you know there's uh so there's there's sort of two potential self images in the dream there's the volcano and then there's the grandmother mm-hmm. and they could both be kind of self images so the the grandmother would be the more uh sort of beneficent version while the volcano and its eruption is the terrifying darkly numinous version but the the grandmother is there with a cool white washcloth right she's cooling down Mm -hmm. the emotional explosion of the volcano and she's doing what a present parent would have done yeah which is to cool things down calm things down and also get some needs met Coffee may not be a primary need of a child, but it, like you said, it's symbolic. <laughs> it's one of my of primary needs. <laughs> <laughs> but she's um, she's going through a process of change, and and there is some really intense restructuring happening. She also mentions just at the end that a couple of weeks prior, she had a dream involving giants battling in a volcanic landscape. Mm. which certainly evokes that myth of Zeus and Typhon yes. battling on the yeah. earth and crashing into things. And so we might even fantasize that Typhon has been kind of cast into the earth several weeks ago, and mm. now there's this volcanic eruption of what has been mm. cast aside. It's a, it's a powerful, powerful dream and, a, and clearly an encounter. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisjungianlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.